LG G5 will go down in history as one of the company's boldest, most ambitious misses. Instead of doubling down on a strategy that seems to have floundered big time though, LG has plotted a more conventional course to build this, the G6. By far, the most peculiar thing about it is its extra long screen and yeah, it takes a little getting used to. Beyond that though, the G6 is a more sensible kind of flagship smartphone for LG and it's all the better for it. For one, it actually feels like a flagship phone. The G5 was good looking in a cutesy sort of way, but the G6's all glass and metal design make it feel like a sturdy, if lightweight, slab of productivity. You'll find the micro SIM and micro SD slot on the right side, and you'll probably need that latter. Most versions of the G6, including the ones you can buy in the US, come with only 32 gigabytes of onboard storage. And as always, you get less to play with right out of the box. We have to talk about the screen though. When I say it's big and bright, I really mean it. The 5.7 inch IPS LCD takes up 80% of the phone's face, and its 18 by nine aspect ratio means it's longer than you'd expect. It runs at Quad HD Plus, or 2880 by 1440, and in general, it's really crisp, appropriately vivid, and packs some really great viewing angles too. The screen's rounded corners are also eye-catching, and they're apparently handy for reducing the stress on the screen when dropped. I accidentally tested how durable the G6 and its screen are at dinner one night. I lost my grip on the phone and dropped it from an upstairs table about 10 feet onto the hard ground floor below. Just look at this thing, it's still in incredible shape. And had the phone wound up in a fish tank on the way down, it still would have been okay. Unlike the G5, this thing is IP68 water and dust resistant. The added benefit is that the G6 as a whole is damn comfortable to hold for long periods of time. Most phones I've used after the G6, with the notable exception of Samsung's Galaxy S8, felt enormous next to this thing. You'll get some pesky black boxes on either side of most videos you watch since they're usually shot in 16 by nine widescreen, but the benefits are definitely worth it. It's generally fast too, thanks to the Snapdragon 821 chipset and the four gigabytes of RAM running the show. Yes, you're right, this isn't Qualcomm's latest and greatest chipset, but it's undeniably more than enough for most people's day-to-day -day grind. My days are filled with a lot of slack and a lot of email, which the phone obviously handles just fine, but getting all that work stuff done in the split-screen multitasking mode worked especially well because of the horsepower on display and, well, that super long display. The software situation is pretty much what you'd expect. The usual LG interface is painted on top of Android 7.0 Nougat, and it really hasn't changed that much since the G5 and the V20. A few changes had to be made to accommodate the screen though. They give you the option to change how apps are scaled to fit on the display, though most of the time you never really need to worry about it. LG also tweaked a few of its core apps, like the calendar and its contact list to display even more information when you rotate the phone. And since LG is pretty cozy with Google, the G6 was, at least for a while, the first non-Pixel smartphone to get the Google Assistant. In my experience, it works just as well as the Pixel, so there's that. The dual camera setup around back has been polished too, to the point where I missed having it around when I was reviewing other devices. Unlike last year, the G6's regular and wide angle cameras shoot at the same 13 megapixel resolution, so you wind up with similarly crisp, very brightly colored shots no matter which you shoot with. Most of the time, you'll probably stick to the up-close camera. With its f1.8 aperture, it's the better all-around shooter and does better in low light. The wide-angle camera lacks optical image stabilization and autofocus, but the more expansive photos it's capable of capturing are generally worth it. New to the mix are a handful of shooting modes that take advantage of that extra long screen. For example, you can instantly preview photos you took on one side of the screen while retaining a live view on the other, or you can quickly build an Instagram-ready 4x4 grid of shots. Selfies taken with the 5 megapixel front facing camera were mostly solid, but vloggers will probably appreciate the full manual video controls here. It's just as well too, since the G6 takes above average video at quality up to 4K. So yeah, the G6 is mostly great. Not all is perfect though. The at t version of the phone I tested is loaded up with a lot of bloat by default, including repeat notifications to set up a direct TV remote that I never want to use. LG has pushed high fidelity audio with its other smartphones, but it's just totally missing in both of the G6s I tested. You'll have to track down a Korean version if you really want it, though we hear all that high quality music burns through the battery fast. Speaking of the battery, I wish the LG G6 just had a slightly better one. The sealed 3300 mAh battery was generally enough to stick around for a full day of work and play, and if I was lucky, I'd have just a little juice left over the next morning too. That's not bad, but I was kind of expecting more. 
for the first time in what feels like ages, LG has built a phone that feels ready to compete with the best of the best. Whether or not it actually beats the competition is a very personal call. Despite some very good work here, I still think the lure of the Galaxy S8 will keep the G6 from picking up the kind of steam LG really needs. And that's a shame too. This is some of the best smartphone work they've ever done. And while you should definitely consider it when you go looking for your next smartphone, know that LG's work just might not be enough.